Today, I'd like to talk to you about three different questions. Can reason, not just revelation, give us reasons to believe that God is love? So many people have heard this idea of God is love, but can we know this not just from revelation, but also from reason on the basis of philosophy? Secondly, I want to address a challenge that's come up about whether Aquinas contradicts himself about God and Jesus. So Aquinas is going to say things like, God does not have a body. But Aquinas also seems to think that Jesus has a body. So it seems as if Aquinas is contradicting his own views. Finally, I'm going to talk about how Aquinas thinks we can find our deepest happiness. One of the things that follows from what we said earlier is an analysis of God and what I'll call the passions. So passions take place through bodily changes. Things like your heart beating faster or adrenaline shooting through your body. The passions, say like anger, cause bodily changes in ourselves. But if Aquinas is right that God has no body, well, then God can't have bodily changes. And if we think of passions and emotions as made up of bodily changes, well, then God doesn't have passions. Passions also mark a change in the typical state of an individual. But as you know, Aquinas thinks that God is without change. So think about the passion of anger. You go from one state, say being calm, and you go into a different state of agitation and rage. But if God is without change, well, God can't go from one state to some other state. And so God can't have emotional changes that are typical of human beings. Passions also belong to something that is existing in potency. And as you know from earlier, our earlier discussions, there is no potency in God. Well, in order to become angry, right, you have to have that potency. You have to be able to become angry. And in God, there is no potency. God is a being a pure actuality. God can't be composed of partly actuality and partly potency. And so in God, there is no potency. And so there would be no grounds, you might say, for passions or emotions for God to become angry, for example. Now, this poses a kind of problem in a way for Aquinas that it says in scripture, for instance, in various passages, that God became angry. And so how does Aquinas deal with those passages? It seems as if Aquinas's uh, reason, saying that God has no passions, is in contradiction to Revelation. Well, what Aquinas notes is that there are other passages that talk about God being unchanging. And so either the passages about God changing are metaphorical, or the passages about God being unchanging are metaphorical. And so what Aquinas says is that it's really the passages about God changing for instance, God becoming angry, that are metaphorical. So you might think about it a little bit like this. Think about the sun. Well, the sun, with respect to us, isn't really changing. I mean, I know technically it's changing. It's uh, undergoing all kinds of changes. But in a certain way, you might say the sun is always hot, right? The sun is always giving off light. Now, that won't always be true. You know, billions and billions of years from now, the sun's going to burn out. But in terms of our human experience, you could say the sun is always hot, the sun is always bright, the sun is unchanging. But our experience of the sun is something that changes. So think about, say, a wonderful July 4th day. You're sitting beside the pool and you're drinking a nice, cool thing of 7-Up and it just feels wonderful. But the sun is really hot, it's like 90 degrees, and every time you get a little bit too hot, you jump in the pool and cool off and then you get out of the pool again and the sun feels just absolutely wonderful. So you might say your experience of the sun in that situation is very positive. On the other hand, imagine the very same day, the very same sun is heating you up to 95 degrees, but rather than sitting beside the pool and jumping in the water every now and then and drinking a nice cool 7-Up, you are walking through a desert. The sun is blazing down on you and you're worried about getting dehydrated and you feel as if you might even die of heat exhaustion. Well, you're experiencing the sun as an enemy. 
Now, there's no difference whatsoever in the sun. The sun is always doing what the sun is always doing. The sun is just hot and the sun is sending off light and that's just what the sun does. But what changed is you, right? You went from one circumstance, one relationship to the, to the sun, sitting beside the pool and jumping in the, in the nice cool water to a radically different relationship to the sun, walking through the desert and feeling like you're about to die of dehydration. So in a similar way, Aquinas' view is something like this. God is always doing what God does. God is always loving. God is always good. God is always truthful. But our relationship to God, that can radically change. So if we're in harmony with God, if we're living in the truth, if we're acting in a good way, if we're loving others, well, we're going to feel that harmony with God. And that's going to be experienced by us as something very positive. On the other hand, if we are not in harmony with God, if we're acting against love, if we're acting against the truth, if we're acting against goodness, well, we're going to experience God as something really alien to us, as something foreign to us, as something judgmental to us. We're going to be like the person walking in the desert in the blazing sun. But again, it's not really God that's changing at all. In fact, on Aquinas' view, God doesn't change at all. God is always loving. God is always good. God is always truthful. But what can change and does change radically is our relationship to God. So these scriptural passages that talk about God becoming angry are accurately portraying the disharmony between the author of scripture and God. That is to say that when people are out of harmony with God, they experience God as if God were angry. And so scripture is telling us something very important when it talks about God's anger, but Aquinas is making the point here that we would misread scripture if we read it as kind of a literal sense of anger, that God is has a body and God is in heaven and God's um, heart rate gets more and he gets a lot of adrenaline and he gets really angry. Well, that, that can't take place. So when we read these passages in scripture that talk about God changing, it is true that God's relationship to us is changing, but that's not because God is changing, it's because we are changing. So what is love? Well, we can think about love in two different dimensions. We can think about love as a choice or as a decision on the one hand, or we can think about love as a passion, as an emotion, as something that happens to us. Now, for reasons I've just said, God doesn't have any passions and God doesn't have emotions. And so love as a passion or as an emotion is for Aquinas something that God does not have. But God does, on the other hand, have choice. God has freedom. God has a will. And so love as a choice is something that could be possible for God. And Aquinas thinks that love is made up of really three different aspects. One would be willing the good of the other person for the other person's sake. So if I love my daughter Mary, I will what's good for her, for instance, being healthy, for her own sake. In other words, I want her to be healthy for her own good. And I choose to help her to become healthy. Maybe I drive her to the doctor in order to get uh, a checkup. Love also involves appreciating the other person. So if I love my daughter, I appreciate the good that is her. So I appreciate how intelligent she is and how she does her homework right away and how beautiful she is and what a sweet person she is. And so I appreciate the good that is in her. And finally, love involves seeking unity with the other person. So maybe I seek unity with my daughter by singing songs with her or by going out to eat with her. So I seek unity with her. I try to do things with her. And so love is a choice and it's a choice to will the good of the other person. It's a choice to appreciate the other person and it is the choice to seek unity with the other person. So love, in other words, you might say involves the will. Love can also be a passion, something that we may not will and just happens to us. But love is, in another sense, something about the will. And Aquinas thinks that happiness is found in loving other people. He thinks that happiness is found ultimately in loving God and loving our neighbor. And so that's how he thinks human beings find happiness. 
So in chapter 91 of the Summa Contra Gentiles, Aquinas gives a number of philosophical arguments that God is love. And this might be a little bit surprising because the idea that God is love, you might say, or you might think, would be something that solely is found in Revelation. It's simply and only a matter of whatever, what the Bible teaches or what Jesus teaches. But Aquinas actually thinks that reason and philosophy can lead us to the conclusion that God is love. So here's why he thinks that. The nature of love is to will the good for the one he loves. But as we saw earlier, God wills his own good. And so God is love. True love, Aquinas says, is willing someone else's good as someone else's good. That is to say, if I will someone's good for my sake, I want my daughter to be healthy so that she can help me mow the lawn. Well, I'm not really willing her good for her sake. I'm really, in a way, using her as a means to my own ends. But God wills his own good and the good of creatures for their sake. In other words, when God wills our existence and wills to keep us in existence and wills that we have good things, friends, health, knowledge, those things are for our sake. Remember that Aquinas thinks that God is absolutely perfect. That is to say that God can't be improved. God has every good. So when God wills our good, it's not for his own sake, that he can get better and he can improve. God would not will our health so that we can mow the, the lawn, right? God doesn't need anything from us. And so when God wills our good, this is willing our good for our own sake. But that's exactly what true love is. True love wills someone's good for their own sake. And that's exactly what God does for us. He wills our own good for our own sake. And so God is someone who truly loves us. God also knows and appreciates himself. God knows that he exists. We talked about this in an earlier discussion. And God also appreciates himself. God knows himself as good. God knows his own reality. And the same thing is true on Aquinas' view for us. God knows that we exist. God knows himself as first cause, and therefore he knows everything he causes. And among the things he causes is you and me. So God knows us and God also appreciates all the good that is in us. I mean, think about all the good things you've done in your whole life. That's a lot, right? If I think back to my whole life, I'm sure I've forgotten all kinds of good things I've done. I'm sure at some point in fourth grade, I was nice to someone on the playground, but I've forgotten that. God knows, on Aquinas' view, all the good that we've done all through our life. From the very beginning of our life as little kids, all the way through, to the present hour. God knows that and God appreciates that. And for Aquinas, that's part of love. If you love someone, you know and appreciate the good that they are, the good that they have, the good that they've done. And God knows and appreciates those goods in us. Aquinas also links up love with unity. And he says, the more the lover is one with the one he loves, the more intense is the love. God's union with himself is the greatest, and therefore God's love of himself is the greatest. So the more the lover is one with the one he loves, the more intense the love is. So think about the great intensity of love that can exist between a husband and wife. Their love is very intense. Why? Because their love is filled with such unity, right? They're unified in raising their children, they're unified in living their lives together, they're unified in a bodily way. So they have a very intense unity and therefore they have a very intense love. But God's union with himself is the most intense, the most unified. And so God's love of himself is the greatest. Now this idea of God being love is clearly found in scripture. There's many passages that say God is love. And so here too, we find a, a great harmony between faith and reason. So reason teaches that God is love for the reasons I've just talked about, but we also see the very same idea, the very same teaching found in Revelation, found in scripture. Now, does scripture teach that God changes? It does, again, seem to be uh, in certain passages that suggest that God changes, that God becomes angry or God repents of his wrongdoing. And for reasons I've mentioned, I think it's best to understand these passages as Aquinas does 
as metaphorical, as teaching us something very important about God, but not God in himself, but rather God in relationship to us. So God, does God repent of the wrongdoing he does? Well, not in himself, God is unchanging. God from all eternity is perfect truth, perfect goodness, perfect life, perfect love. And so God never changes. But what can change is our relationship to God. So when we go from being out of harmony with God to being back into harmony with God, that change in us causes a change in our relationship to God. And so from our perspective, you might say, God appears to repent of what he was thinking of doing, repenting of punishing us or something. So this is, these passages in scripture are telling us very important things about God's relationship to us, but we would misunderstand them if we took them in a really literalistic sense, that God goes from loving us to being angry with us and punishing us, and then goes back to loving us. That's not accurate. I mean, God is always loving us, but God's relationship to us can and does change when we change in relationship to God. What is metaphorical for Thomas becomes literal in what's called process thought. So process thought about God holds that God himself is always changing. And so they would say, well, no, it's not that God is unchanging. God is always changing. So God really does become angry with us like a human parent might do. And then God really does repent of what he was considering, uh, considering punishing us with, again, the way a human parent might do. Aquinas would say those sorts of readings of scripture are quite naive because God is a spiritual being that doesn't have a body. And so God can't become angry in a bodily, physical way, the way a human parent could do, right? God doesn't have blood pressure that goes up and doesn't have cortisol that shoots out and doesn't have adrenaline. God, God doesn't get into a fight or flight physiology. And so these passages are really important because they're telling us something important about God's relationship with us and how if we have a bad relationship with God, we're going to experience God as angry, for example. In the beginning of these lectures and discussions, I talked about this distinction between the preambles of faith and the mysteries of faith. And so as we draw these discussions to a close, I want to return to that distinction. So recall that Aquinas thought that some truths that God reveals to us could be known as true through reason. And so we've seen now maybe some of these truths. So the idea that there's an uncaused cause, which we call God, that something like that exists. Aquinas thinks we can know that through reason, through philosophy, through arguments that we can share based not on revelation, but based on things which in principle, any person of goodwill could understand. Aquinas thinks that also we can know through reasoning that there's just one God could there be many gods? Well, it depends on what you mean by God. If you mean by God, just a super powerful being like Zeus or Hera, well, yeah, there could be multiple of those. But recall what Aquinas means by God isn't just a super powerful being, but rather something like the uncaused cause, the unmoved mover, the absolutely necessary being, the highest good. And Aquinas thinks there can be only one of those. Aquinas argues also on the basis of reason that God is intelligent and that God has a will. And as we've seen today, that God is love. Now, all of these are preambles of faith that we can know to be true through reasoning, through philosophy, through arguments that are based not on revelation, but on principles that are available to all people of goodwill. So, there are also, Aquinas thinks, mysteries of faith. So those would be things like the idea that Jesus is God. He thinks that that is something that we could know not through philosophy, but rather through revelation. That we come to believe that Jesus is God because we trust what Jesus says. And similarly with the idea that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is not, on Aquinas' view, something that reason can show to be true is something that goes beyond what reason can show to be true. So it's a little bit like a human relationship where we can know certain things that you might call preambles that are true of a person. For example, that this person is intelligent, this person is uh, willing or good, that this person is attentive to us, all kinds of things like that. 
But there are other things about a person that you could only know if that person reveals it to us. So the person might say to us, I am unbelievably scared of what's going to happen next month. And if you just look to the person, you probably wouldn't be able to tell that. Or maybe the person tells us something about themselves like, I had the most wonderful parents. You wouldn't, wouldn't believe it. Or the reverse, I had the most terrible parents. In a similar way, there are truths about God that we can know through reason, like there's just one God, that God is intelligent, that God has a will. But there are many other truths about God that we could only know if God reveals them to us. And that's exactly what Aquinas thinks God did. Aquinas thinks that God revealed to us the fullness of God in Jesus, that Jesus is, in fact, himself, the fullness of God's revelation. So are these mysteries of faith, say that Jesus is God or that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are these against reason? Are these contrary to reason? Well, Aquinas' view would be that, no, they're not. They go beyond reason. Reason can't show that they're true, but they're not against reason. In a similar way, if a friend of yours says, oh my gosh, my parents were the most amazing people in the world, that doesn't really go against reason. Everything you know about your parent or about this friend is compatible with the idea that this friend of yours had a great parents. Um, but it goes beyond reason because simply looking at your friend and knowing your friend doesn't necessarily give you that understanding that your friend had great parents. And so Aquinas is gonna say the same thing about the mysteries of faith. Yes, they go beyond reason, but they're not against reason. They're not contrary to reason. But there's a problem with that. If Aquinas is right that Jesus is God, and if he's right that human knowledge is not like divine knowledge, well, then does Jesus know like God, or does Jesus know like a human being? Another problem we talked about earlier was this idea that if Aquinas is right that Jesus is God, well, then is Thomas wrong that God does not have a body? Again, there seems to be a kind of contradiction in Aquinas' view that Aquinas would seem to go against reason. If Aquinas is right that Jesus is God, well, then is Aquinas wrong that an eternal God has no potency to suffer and die? Here again, we see a potential contradiction in Aquinas. And so faith and reason would seem to be opposed rather than in harmony. So Aquinas does answer these uh, difficulties. Here's Aquinas' view. Jesus has two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. And this distinction between divine nature and human nature helps Thomas to overcome these difficulties. So let me try to explain exactly how this works. So first, we have to distinguish between a nature and a person. So the question, what is it, is the question that is answered by nature. So if you say, well, what is this thing over here? Well, it's a tree, or it's a dog, or it's a human being. The nature of a thing is what the thing is. And nature determines what an individual can do. So if you're a tree, you can do certain things like photosynthesis. If you're a dog, you can do other kinds of things, maybe here at a frequency outside of what humans can hear. And if you're a human being, well, that gives you a nature that gives you the ability to do things like reason or laugh or compose poetry. Now the question, who is it, is the question that corresponds to what a person is. So the person is who does the activity in question. So who does the reasoning, who writes the poetry? The person is the individual who knowingly and freely does the operations. Person and nature are, you might say, uh, two different dimensions that we can talk about. And in some cases, like an oak tree, there is one nature, but no person. An oak tree has a nature, it can do certain things, but it's not a person because it doesn't freely do any of those things. An oak tree doesn't decide, I'm gonna do photosynthesis today. I'm gonna to drop some acorns today. I'm gonna to do this or that. Well, no, it just automatically in virtue of its nature does whatever it does. But take a different example. Jennifer is a person and she's one person. And so, and she has one nature. She has a human nature because she has a, a nature. She can do 
certain things. She's, she has a human nature, so she can do the activities of a human being. So she can write short stories, she can sew dresses, she can talk to her kids, she can talk to her husband, she can do all kinds of things because she has a human nature. But she also is a person, so she's an individual who knowingly and willingly can do those things, right? She can choose to sew a dress or choose to write a short story or choose to go to the store. She can choose to do all kinds of things freely and knowingly. So unlike the oak tree, which just automatically does photosynthesis, Jennifer as a person can exercise the various operations that her nature allows her to exercise, like knowing and willing and writing uh, poetry, etc. Now, Thomas Aquinas believes that Jesus is one person with two natures. In his divine nature, Jesus is eternal, without a beginning and without an end. In his divine nature, Jesus has no body, for reasons we've talked about earlier. In his divine nature, Jesus cannot suffer or die. In his divine nature, Jesus has divine knowledge and a divine will. So Jesus, on Aquinas' view, is fully divine. But he's also fully human. And so he has a full human nature. Jesus, in his human nature, is not eternal, but comes into existence in the womb of his mother Mary. Jesus, in his human nature, does have a body. He takes on a body in the womb of his mother Mary. Jesus, in his human nature, can suffer and can die. Jesus, in his human nature, has human knowledge. So Jesus, for instance, in his human nature, knew things through his senses. He would see things, he would hear things, he would remember things, and he could, in his human nature, grow to know more and more. He could grow in wisdom. And Jesus, also in his human nature, has a human will. So Aquinas believes that Jesus is one person with two natures. So as a person, Jesus can freely and knowingly do things, and he has two natures. He has the divine nature and also the human nature. So if Aquinas is right, Jesus has both human knowledge and divine knowledge. If Aquinas is right, Jesus in his divine nature has no body, but in his human nature takes on a body. Jesus does not suffer and die in his divine nature, but does suffer and die in his human nature. This brings us to another very important topic for conversation, and that would be the relationship of God with God. So if there's only one God, what does God think about? For if God is an intelligent being, he must think of something. And if there's only one God, who does God love? For to be happy, one must love. Is the first cause an egoist God? sitting in solitary splendor before the world began and reduced to loving himself as a kind of selfish deity? Well, Aquinas would answer that question with a no. So God thinks and knows himself. You might say God is an eternal thinker who thinks in eternal thought, in eternal word. That thought or word is infinite and equal to himself and hence a person who is unique and absolute. The eternal thinker and the eternal thought share an eternal love, which you could call the Holy Spirit. And so Christians at least will recognize right away that Aquinas is talking about the Holy Trinity here. You have the eternal thinker, the Father, who has an eternal thought, the Son, and they share an eternal love, the Holy Spirit. These are three persons in one God. They share one nature as God, and they are, however, three different persons. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you might say, are like a heavenly family into which we are offered adoption. To be offered adoption is a great gift. It is to be welcomed into a family, even though you're not, biologically speaking, a member of that family. Once you're adopted, you become a true member of that family. To be adopted as a Kayser means that I really am a Kayser, and I share in that family name, that family tradition, and 
to be adopted is to become a member of that family. Now, I'm not a member of the Kayser family by biology, but I am a member of the Kayser family by adoption. And so God, on Aquinas' view, invites us to be part of that heavenly family, to be an adopted child of God. And to become an adopted child of God is to begin to share in God's own perfect happiness. So Thomas thinks that God in himself is perfectly happy. God's intellect is perfectly satisfied with God's truth. God's will is perfectly satisfied with God's goodness. And in God, nothing whatsoever is missing. And so God is happy with his own perfection. And in God, there's no evil whatsoever, since God is pure goodness. And so God doesn't suffer from any sort of evil. In God, in other words, there's a perfect communion of love, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit loving each other perfectly from all eternity. And so God is, on Aquinas' view, perfect happiness. And when we come into a relationship with God, we begin to share some part of that happiness. So we also have an intellect, and our intellect is satisfied by the truth. And for Thomas, God is that perfect truth. Our will also seeks what's good, and God is that perfect goodness. And so when we connect with God, we have some share in God's perfect goodness. We also seek perfection, and in God, we're able to find that. And in God, we're able to overcome the evils that we experience in our own lives. The Trinity, in other words, for Aquinas, is connected very deeply to our perfect happiness. And what Aquinas calls perfect happiness, he also calls heaven. Heaven, in other words, is where we find in the fullness of God, those things which slake the thirst of hearts, and satisfy the hunger of starving minds, and give rest to unrequited love. Heaven is, you might say, the communion with perfect life, perfect truth, and perfect love. So if we're going to have this perfect happiness, we need to have a perfected relationship with perfect happiness. And Aquinas, as, you, as I just noted, thinks of God as being perfect happiness. And this makes sense, too, with what we said earlier about God's love. God seeks unity with other persons. God wants to be unified with us now and forever. And God wants us to share in this loving relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You might say that God wants to adopt us into the divine family. And to be unified with God, what Aquinas calls that is sanctifying grace. That is to be adopted as a child of God. It's to become part of God's family. And it's possible for us to lose that unity with God. We can be like the prodigal son who leaves the family and runs off and does his own thing. And then hell would be the permanent loss of that divine being a child of God. And heaven, by contrast, as the intrinsic reward, the permanent place in the family. And so what has been the point of all this discussion of God? Well, Aquinas thinks that these truths about God are not merely for the sake of intellectual curiosity. It's not merely to know some interesting facts. But rather, in order to love something, we have to know something about it. If we're going to love our best friend, of course, we have to know our best friend. And the greater our knowledge of the beloved, the greater our love can become. In other words, if you know your best friend, and your best friend is an amazing person, totally wonderful, just absolutely great person, well, the more you know about this person, if this person is really great, the more you're going to love that person your love is going to intensify because your knowledge is greater. If the object of our love is lovable and good, well, the greater knowledge we have of this object, the greater our love becomes. And that's exactly why Aquinas wrote what he wrote. He wanted us to know God more and therefore love God more. Now, one challenge remains for Aquinas that we have not yet dealt with, and that is the problem of evil. If God is all good, he would want to destroy all evil. If God is all knowing, he would know how to destroy all evil. If God is all powerful, he could destroy all evil. And so does evil disprove the existence of God? At least God is understood by Thomas Aquinas. Well, that is a very important question, a wonderful question, but it's a question that will have to remain for next time.